um, in, in, in terms of kind of a, a long-term outlook, it, it does weaken the public perception of them, right? And so I think um, we have to, we have to uh, really strengthen labor rights. And, and I guess even beyond that, when we're thinking about public policies, right? When we're thinking about um, uh, investing in the kinds of technology that will allow us to move to a greener infrastructure, we have to overcome some of the political ideas that exist in our society, right? That, that um, uh, investing in green jobs is maybe not the right way to ensure that working people uh, have good jobs, right? So, you know, like, um, obviously we're having a, a you know, a lot of our political divisions in this country, going back to the 2016 election and, and of course beyond that, stem from this idea that, um, uh, you know, what we've got to do is, is sort of double down on these sort of uh, uh, t technologies that are heavily related to pollution like coal, right? That that's wh where we need to put our money and in infrastructure because people already have jobs there. And so I think one of the reasons that you see um, a lot of working Americans support those kinds of policies and support that kind of rhetoric is because they can't trust that their political system is going to ensure that if they do end up not working in say coal, that they're gonna have uh, a government that works for them to make sure that they'll have access to good jobs, that invest in those kinds of things that, uh, you know, those sort of clean technologies and, and make sure that they have the skills that they need and the union representation they need so that those jobs are, are good bets long-term. So, I mean, I, so, I mean, I think if we, you know, uh, if we kind of look at those bigger, the bigger political picture, we need to figure out how to build a political movement that prioritizes, in addition to uh, green energy, that prioritizes uh, the jobs and livelihoods of working people and make sure that's front and center. And I think if we do that, and Jesse's absolutely right, right? Like the, the, the tech, there, are, there are no technical reasons why, technological reasons why we couldn't have that kind of infrastructure and those kinds of jobs. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, John, um, getting the young workforce. And you touched on it with the four-year degree. Um, it's, uh, we frequently, our apprenticeship committee will get out into the, the, the school districts, the public uh, high school education systems, and we sit down and we talk to students. Um, we, we talk to guidance counselors, and, and it's hard to convince a high school guidance counselor that, you know, to, to tell a potential student, hey, maybe a four-year post-high school program is, is not right for you. Um, do, do you really think you have the, the ability to sit through another four years of, of, of even tougher education? Um, you know, the, the guidance counselors know those students best. The teachers know those students best. We still have some parents who may, you know, alma mater, you rah, rah, you got to go to where mm -hmm. I went. Um, that exists. It's real. It does happen. Um, even though they know in their heart of hearts that, that their own son or daughter is probably better working in the trades. Um, and when we talk to those guidance counselors and we talk to those parents and we talk to those teachers and we show them what a good working career uh, that can be had from being a union electrician or a union laborer or a union carpenter or so on and so forth, they're, they're usually you know, completely flabbergasted at, the, at the, the honest living wage that can be earned. It, it's not just a job swinging a hammer or putting in solar panels, it's a career. You can really make a good career out of it, a family supporting career. Um, and, and that's, you know, again, we talked about roadblocks to getting there. That's, that's one of those, in my opinion, is, you know, and the UW systems are, are in my, I don't have any data, but I would think they're, you know, they have a lot of kids coming in and we're not trying to take away, you know, the unions and apprenticeship programs are not in any way, shape or form trying to take away uh, entry level students or, you know, those, those college kids that want a college education. We're not, we're not trying to steer them away and we're not trying to crash the college education system. Uh, we're trying to take those students who, you know, and catch them early enough where we can say, you know what, maybe construction is for you. Let, let's get you, you know, into a youth apprenticeship program. You're senior, you're in high school, you're, you're out working with contractors. Um, you can really kind of get a leg up. And, and by the time you're 21, you can, you know, be almost a, a full fledged state licensed electrician making, you know, thirty-four dollars an hour, and your employer's paying your your pension and your um, your healthcare for you. So, yeah, and, and and I would just add to that, we gotta we gotta make sure that that perception continues by making sure that those jobs long term are sustainable, right? And so that's where the public investment, I think, comes in, right? I mean, making sure that um, you know, because we've had 
in other sectors, uh, he heavily union dense sectors like manufacturing, for example, right? I mean, we've seen um, a lot of union jobs move elsewhere to other parts of the country. And that's something that employers um, often want to do is, cheap, is, is seek cheaper non-union labor. And so, you know, I think part of what, and, and you're absolutely right. I, I'm so glad to hear you put it that way because we can have a strong UW system where some people are going it that way and we can have a really strong system of apprenticeships where people are going that way and we can, we can fill all the needs for the workforce um, in this state. We've got to make sure that um, everybody, though, who's working, whether they're coming out of the trades or coming out of the UW system, has access to a good job. And so I think, to me, I think that's the biggest impediment is, you know, to a green infrastructure is making sure that everybody's economic needs are taken care of at the same time. And, and that's where you see the kinds of, and I know you're not making this argument, but that's where you sometimes see, you know, unions oppose, um, you know, Green New Deal initiatives because they see it as a threat to their livelihood, and I would just say part of the reason for that is because, you know, we haven't had a we haven't had a government that's in, that's ensured people's livelihoods the way that it, that it should. So I think if we sort of focus everything around that, we can get both. Yeah, and just real quick, I'll comment. You're outsourcing uh, manufacturing jobs. Nice thing with uh, renewable energy, you can outsource it. That's true. Look at Manitowoc. Um, uh, two Creeks, there's a 150 megawatt solar farm going in in Two Creeks. You can't outsource that. Those panels have to get installed at that site. The work has to be done at that site. The cable needs to get pulled. The footings need to be installed. That's not a job that can get outsourced. So it, it's wind turbines, um, wind farms, you know, whatever the case is, you're building local clean, en clean energy, just like power plants. You can't outsource the power plant jobs. So you're not going to be able to outsource these jobs. They're going to be good, well-paying local jobs when that comes. Yeah, great point. Okay, I have the next question. So labor unions have been largely split over the Green New Deal. And one example being the Minis in Minnesota where the Service Employees International Union recently came out in support of the Green New Deal. But meanwhile, many unions representing the manufacturing, construction and trade jobs have been hesitant to show their support. Uh, we're wondering what you believe needs to happen to bring all labor unions on board for a clean energy transition. I'll let you tackle that one to start with, John. Well, I, I, I thought since you were uh, in one of those unions, you might want to. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think, again, it, it just comes down to um, any investments that are made in clean energy, you know, need to really be framed around the livelihoods of working people. And, and I know that seems kind of a, like a strange way to put it because, you know, I think a lot of people look at say, oh, well, I'll just use the green, I mean, we'll, we're talking specifically about the Green New Deal. You know, I think a lot of people look at it as, um, you know, about the environment first, right? And, and you know, I, I don't know how many people on this Zoom meeting today have, have uh, read the Green New Deal, the actual policy proposal that came out uh, you know, from, uh, I think it was Ed Markey and Ocasio-Cortez. Um, it's a jobs program. I mean, that, that's, that's really what it is. I mean, it's it, it, it certainly like, it's about building green infrastructure, but I think what's so good about the, the Green New Deal proposal is that it's, it's pitched as, a, as something that will ensure basically everybody has more or less, I mean, they don't quite put it this way, but more or less the right to a job. Um, so, you know, I, I actually think uh, one of the, the ways to ensure that there's less of that kind of division is to really make it clear that that's what we're trying to do with a green infrastructure, that, that if we invest in a green infrastructure, it will actually ensure that working people have the right to a job. And, um, you know, I think the problem is you can contrast that with, say, um, uh, you know, the, the Hillary Clinton's argument in 2016 that was used, again, I'll just go back to, the, to that election. That was that was used against her by um, conservatives. Uh, you know that she would put a lot of coal miners out of business, right, or, or close a lot of coal plants, or something along those lines. Um, recently, you know, Joe Biden in the past few months sort of doubled down on that and said, "We're going to teach coal miners how to become computer coders." Well, maybe that works, but you know that's a that's a pretty far leap for people that have had you know, a livelihood, even as, as, you know, sort of dangerous as say coal mining can be, um, those people rightly fear what their economic future looks like. And so I think by framing green infrastructure around uh, working people's livelihoods rather than just an, 
and I know, you know, this may seem kind of simplistic, but just, um, you know, green infrastructure, if we can really bring those two things together and strongly articulate that that's what we're doing and articulate that um, these investments in green infrastructures will bring new union jobs. And we're going to back that with, say, um, legislation to strengthen unions and prevailing wages and, um, you know, priority in union contracts that that will assure more unions that and, and more working people who belong to those unions that these are good investments because it's actually going to make their economic livelihoods more secure. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to be talking about those two things in tandem. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I'm, I'm not I'm not very politically active. Um, so I, I don't know a ton about the Green New Deal. I, I do know that the IBW president, Lonnie Stevenson, signed a letter um, expressing some concern over it. And, and I think you're right, John, there is a there's, there's a, a concern in the union, the IB electrical workers union, you know, as an example, the union has a lot of employees, a lot of union workers currently making good wages in those power plants and the, the coal fired plants, the natural gas plants um, as operators. Uh, coal fired plants, natural gas plants are extremely maintenance intensive. They have to be staffed heavily at all times. There's always upgrades and projects going on in those plants. Um, so there's always a ton of work opportunity there. Um, so I think there's some concern about, you know, maybe just seeing that maintenance kind of position and maybe, maybe that's not the right term, but I think there's a concern about, you know, seeing those jobs go away. But I, I do feel that there's an opportunity for, you know, those, those displaced um, coal miners or displaced natural gas power plant operators. Um, they have a skill set. They've, they've worked as much of their life as they've ever, you know, whatever they've worked in those industries, they've got a good skill. They've built a good skill. They, they've learned a lot of things. Um, so unlike a, you know, a student coming out of high school, we don't have to teach that coworker how to show up at 7 a.m. We don't have to teach them how to swing a hammer or how to be respectful to their workers and, and understand how to get along in a group setting. They, they have a lot of skill sets and, and it wouldn't, you know, the, the coal to code, that's a, to me, that's a big jump. Um, teaching a coal miner how to, you know, computer code, that's, I don't, I'm not sure how that would work, um, but teaching a power plant operator how to, you know, be a project manager for a, a big solar farm installation, um, I don't see that big of a leap there. Um, and I think, you know, if there's going to be 160,000 jobs in the clean energy sector um, in the future, th there's going to be a ton of work oppor opportunities for those for those displaced, you know, power plant workers. And, and I think again, I didn't really read the, the Green New Deal, um, but I think there's just a concern that, you know, one, it's going to eliminate all the union jobs in the power plants. And then the bigger concern is that there isn't strong enough um, language in the Green New Deal to make sure that those renewable energy jobs um, are union unionized workers uh, doing those. So, you know, it's, it could be a, a double-edged sword and, you know, completely, you know, whatever whatever foothold the unions have in the industry right now would, would completely wipe it out, in my opinion, when you take away a huge portion of the workload in the power plant section, um, the power generation section, and you replace it with non-unionized, you know, solar panel installers. I mean, that, that would be a kind of a, a double swing um, mm -hmm. hurt. And I think there's definitely some concern about it um, is from a language side of things. So. No, and, and you touched on it. I mean, those are, I think uh, we have to recognize that those concerns are legitimate, right? I mean, the, you know, uh, again, like, I think so many of the conversations we're having are happening in the context of, um, uh, you know, not, not, having a, not having enough guarantees for people's rights, okay? So, you know, how do, how do, how do workers access healthcare, right? They typically do it through their job. How do they how do they access retirement as if they have a union contract right they do it through their job and so there are really good reasons for people who work in coal-fired power plants as you mentioned for them to be worried about what the green new deal might mean for their livelihoods a absolutely and so you know the the devil is in the details and so any 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 program any sustain, sustained program for, for green energy is going to have to figure out how to make it, uh, how to prioritize 
the livelihoods of working class people and make sure that any transitions that are made, uh, you hit the nail right on the head, any of those transitions that are made um, end up being good, good union jobs, right? That they're, that they're not um, a, a pretext to move to non-union labor, right? And so, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the, um, the flip side of what you were talking about earlier, Jesse, actually, you know, like it's not about jobs being outsourced, it's about having different people do the jobs that aren't members of unions, right? So, you know, I think we, we have to prioritize both of those things. And, it's, and it's, uh, it's kind of a ridiculous notion to expect that people that have been working in a coal plant their entire life are suddenly gonna become a computer coder, right? And so like, there's a, I don't, I'm not making, I'm not making any partisan arguments at all. This is not about one side or the other, because I, frankly, I think both sides, both, both parties have a lot to, to do to make sure that um, uh, working people's livelihoods are at the center of these conversations. But we can't, we can't, um, you know, we can't have these arguments based on fantasies like, you know, coal, people that work in coal plants are going to become computer coders. We've got to think about how we can make sure that they have sustainable livelihoods going forward if, as we're making these transitions, which are necessary. Great. So kind of segueing into like the functionality of unions, um, Act 10 sent waves throughout Wisconsin's economy and vastly changed the way unions are able to operate and how they were able to represent workers in the state. How do you see Act 10 affecting future clean energy jobs that could be unionized? Um, Act 10, uh, I think was really a, 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 direct, a direct attack on public unions, uh, city electricians, county electricians, teachers, all the public sector unions is really what Act 10 kind of came through and, and completely upended. It didn't have as big of an effect on the private sector unions, uh, the trades unions and, and things like that. So um, it, unless cities and municipalities and counties are going to be the owners and operators and, and do the, you know, self-install these big power plants, which I can't fathom would happen. I don't know that Act 10 would have a big impact on, um, would, I don't think it would prevent unions from representing green energy workers moving forward. As long as Act 10, you know, stays, and I don't think it's right, um, I don't agree with it, but as long as that stays a private sector issue, uh, excuse me, a public sector issue, I don't know that it would act 10 in itself would have a big effect on the, the private sector construction trades, um, the right to work. I mean, that's a completely different topic. Um, um, but yeah, as far as act 10 goes, I don't, I don't think it would have huge negative effects on unions being able to represent green energy workers. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, I, I, the only thing I would add to that is that, uh, you know, I do think that uh, what act 10 did is it, 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 um, it made things difficult for all unions in, in the state. It made things more difficult for all unions. I mean, one of the things that makes the labor movement or, and has traditionally made the labor movement strong in this country is um, not just the solidarity that exists within um, you know, uh, individual trades or individual uh, unions, but uh, within the labor movement more broadly. So, I mean, I think in the sense that um, a, a lot of um, labor unions in the public sector have you know, lost um, a lot of members. Uh, they, that, that means that they've, they've lost their ability to say advocate for private sector unions. It, it's, it's been made harder. Um, I, don't, I don't know, maybe it's worth just taking a second. We've, we've kind of thrown around Act 10 and, and Right to Work. Maybe we'll just explain for a second exactly what those things did so that everybody who's uh, listening to this knows. So Act 10 was passed in, in 2011. Uh, it effectively took away pretty much all meaningful collective bargaining rights from public employees in the state. Uh, Wisconsin was the first state to um, uh, actually um, give public employees uh, collective bargaining rights. That was in 1959. That happened because uh, a lot of public employees were fighting uh, to get those rights. Um, and uh, so when the law was passed in 2011, it was a sort of big moment. Uh, it, it basically barred certain classes of people like university professors from being able to form a, to collectively bargain at all. Uh, but like teachers, uh, state employees, um, uh, you know, uh, state state nurses, anybody who's a public employee, uh, when Act 10 was passed, they were basically barred from having uh, any negotiations over anything related to their work collectively other than wages. And they could only get wage increases that were as high as the rate of inflation. 
Uh, they also um, uh, were, they also now have to have a representation election every single year. So it depletes a lot of uh, resources from uh, public employee unions. Um, and the other thing that Act 10 did is it, it, it made it easier to weaken private sector unions, right? So uh, the right to work laws probably in 2015, the right to work law uh, probably doesn't happen in Wisconsin without uh, Act 10 happening just a few years before that. And maybe I'll just explain what a right to work law is real quick so people know. Um, in pri private sector unions, right? So that's anybody who's not a government employee. Um, they can obviously negotiate a, a contract. Bef um, individual states can pass laws that forbid unions from negotiating contracts that have something called union security clauses. So what a sec union security clause means is, you know, let's say Jesse's union, you know, I don't know how many members you have, but however many uh, uh, people are in the, the bargaining unit, right? All the people who uh, work uh, in, at a given work site or for an employer, when there's a contract that's bargained, every single person who works there gets all the benefits from that contract, right? But, uh, and so a union security clause ensures that everybody who's represented by that union pays for at least part of the cost of being represented by that union. What right to work laws do is they say, you can't negotiate those kinds of clauses. So people can basically benefit from the contract, but not have to pay anything toward the, their representation costs. So it makes unions weaker because you can have a lot of people who are what we call free riders who get the benefits, but don't contribute. It would be like making, it'd be like if we made taxes optional for everybody, right? Some people would still pay them um, because they are patriotic, but some people wouldn't. And that would mean we'd all have to pay more or our country would be weaker. So um, that's, that's one of the problems with right to work is, 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 is um, you know, it makes it more difficult to have good union jobs because you know, unions who are representing workers. And, and as Jesse will, will tell you, they do more than just represent people in contract negotiations. They run apprenticeship programs. They teach people about workplace safety, um, you know, all, all these kinds of things. It, it, they have less resources to do that with they, if they under a right to work scenario. So sorry for the digression there, but uh, this, I just figured since we we're throwing a lot of those things around, I would just explain them. Yeah, good, good job. Good job explaining that, John. <laughs> Thanks. I do like the uh, right to work comparison to to, to taxes. Um, I mean, I've never thought of, I've never heard of it that way before. But you, you, that is a perfect example of how that functions. Imagine what your city would look like if property taxes were optional. People didn't feel like paying them; they don't have to pay them. They still get to drive on the new roads. Uh, they still get a benefit from a city hall and, and public libraries, but they, they can choose to pay them or not to choose to pay for them. So. That's a great analogy. Absolutely. Okay, I have our next question. Um, are there any examples of policy facilitating a clean energy transition while creating union jobs um, nationally or internationally that you've seen and we feel we could learn lessons from? I, I don't know that I've ever, you know, again, I, I don't, I'm not a, a huge into politics. I don't know that I've ever seen or heard of a policy um, that has allowed for, you know, the creation of, of secure union jobs in the green energy uh, sector. Um, you know, I, I do know Germany has always kind of been a strong apprenticeship based country. Um, unionized uh, to, to the best of my knowledge. Um, you know, there might be some things they've done over there, you know, that we could look into and, and try to mirror. Um, but again, outside of that, I, nothing that comes to my mind, hopefully John can. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this one's a little bit out of my wheelhouse as well. Um, you know, I do know that in, in a lot of places, you know, um, government contracts uh, typically you know, depending on the laws of the state, you know, like New York State is an example of this, Washington State, you know, typically um, uh, any government contracts, there are requirements that uh, the, the um, workforce would be, you know, sort of priority would be given to union workforces, right? So you can imagine a lot of, I, I can't speak to any specifics at the moment, but you can imagine in places that have these sorts of laws um, which this typically does divide along sort of blue and red states, actually. Uh, but states that have those kinds of laws uh, in place, uh, any kind of infrastructure development, uh, green or otherwise, 
but you know, hopefully places that are thinking about you know, green um, uh, infrastructure adjustments, anything would, would have to be done with a union contract in mind. So you know, I, I think doing something like that in Wisconsin long-term would be as, as simple as uh, basically revising our laws that give priority to unions uh, in terms of you know, any, any contracts with public investment. Um, you know, it, 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 it's the right thing to do and, and it's, it actually wouldn't be that hard. It, it, it would actually um, ensure that the work was done and, and done probably better. Great. All right, well, that wraps up um, our pre-made questions and thank you so much for going in depth with Act 10. I really do appreciate it because it's been a while since I've looked at that. Sure. Um, so we're gonna open it up to audience questions. If you have any questions, um, you can either type unmute and you can ask them over microphone. If you don't feel comfortable, you can always type them and we can read them for you here. Um, so let's see, there is a couple in here right now. So I'm gonna move to Terry's question here. Um, how is automation likely to play out in the energy job scene going forward? Um, we're an electrical contractor and, and I, I program a lot of PLCs. So I, I do automation work as well. Um, we teach it in our apprenticeship program. Um, at least on the solar side of things, there's not a lot of automation. It's a pretty simplistic technology. Uh, there's not a lot of, it's not like a paper machine. Um, it's solar panels convert sunlight into electricity and gets dumped into the grid. Um, on the wind side of things, I know there's some automation, you know, but that's typically an, an OEM uh, type of automation. And now maybe I'm answering the question in the wrong fashion. Maybe the question was steered in a different direction. Um, but I, I don't know that automation will have a huge role in the green energy. It's a lot of mechanical labor um, in, in the in the green energy industry, whether you're talking erecting wind turbines or building solar farms. It's just a lot of hands-on labor. Um, so looks like there was a question that I missed earlier. Sorry about that. Um, it says, regrettably, there seem to be a status. Regrettably, there seem to be status issues and working condition issues that cast the trades into a bad light as a viable career option for young adults. Um, do panelists have thoughts about what needs to be done to improve both status and working conditions? Get rid of Instagram. <laughs> Um, it, it's true. I, I'm, I'm not going to argue with that comment. Um, it, workers, you know, you see pictures of old coal miners, you know, old pictures of coal miners. Uh, people think of the trades as a dirty, a dirty trade. Um, you know, people are, are in, in social media, um, you know, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. Um, everybody wants to be an influencer. Nobody wants to physically work with their hands anymore. Um, maybe kids don't like raking the yard or putting the dishes away. It's, it's, I think there's, there is some form of stigma with just doing some physical work. And that's where I think Wisconsin excels. I really do feel that Wisconsin um, is a state and has, has the group of people that really, you know, farm based communities working is what you do. Um, you, you like to work. It's what you were kind of born and raised to do. It, it's, it's what we do and we do it well. Um, but there is a very public, uh, negative perception on, on trades and construction in general, um, just from it being kind of, you know, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent from it being dirty. You're, you're in the mud, you're digging trenches, you're taking break on a five gallon bucket, you're using a porta john for your restroom. Um, it, it's not for the, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it, it's, you gotta, you gotta want to do it, but I don't know how we get past that um, other than really selling the career side of it. Um, you, know, you can do a lot of things to make money. Um, working hard is one of those that, you know, at the end of the day, when I work on a job site and, and I go home and I did a good job and I did a safe job, there's, there's a really huge sense of pride in knowing that, you know, I built a, I built the, the facility over here or I worked at Lambeau Field and, and helped build the south end zone or whatever I did. I get to drive around and I get to show my kids, hey, I worked on that project. I helped build that building. I, I put those light fixtures up over there. Um, there really is a sense of pride in, in working with your hands and being able to build something. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I'd like to add something to that too, which is a, a slightly different dimension. And I'll add a little history lesson here. So, um, you know, th there have been times in the past in the United States and definitely in Wisconsin where, um, 
when politicians, and this is not just Democrats, this is Democrats and Republicans, uh, where politicians, when they thought about uh, policy, um, when they made speeches, uh, they prioritized the needs of people who worked for a living, right? Whether that was somebody who worked with their hands or whether that was a teacher, right? They thought about, um, they thought about um, uh, making policies that would help make working people's lives better and more secure and more stable over the long term. So go back to the 1930s, right? You've got the Wagner Act, which gives private sector workers the right to collectively bargain, which is part of the reason that, that Jesse has those rights right now and has a contract. Um, although that happened because workers pushed for it, right? I don't want to suggest that it just came because Roosevelt was a nice guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you know, you ha you have that. You have social security, which also comes out of the 1930s, which was designed to make working people's lives more stable over the long term. You have Medicare and and Medicaid, which come in the 1960s, right? Which are designed to help people who can't afford help to have health care. Um, and uh, you know, you have uh, public the the rights to for public employees to collectively bargain in the 1950s and 60s. This happens in states across the country. So there's, there was a moment in American history, and I, and I know there were lots of problems with that moment, right? Um, gender was, was, you know, there were very, a lot of gender inequities. Uh, there were, uh, so, you know, civil rights activists pushing for, you know, really long-term inequities that existed. So I'm not romanticizing that moment at all. But what we've seen in the past 40 or 50 years, which maybe seems like a long time to everybody, but as a historian, it's kind of a short time, at least the way I think about it, is we've seen a move away from that. So so many people who work for a living don't believe that the government is on their side. They don't believe that there are any politicians, maybe in, in either party, who are really on their side. So let's go back for a second to the 1990s when um, NAFTA is negotiated. It was Republicans, started under George H.W. Bush, and then Democrats under Clinton, not all Democrats, but, but Clinton wanted NAFTA. And a lot of people, a lot of working people, felt like what NAFTA did even if, free, even if you think free trade is good, that, it, that it, didn't, um, it didn't put the needs of working people at the forefront of those decisions. And so oftentimes when somebody is thinking about what they're going to do for a living, they're thinking about what's going to be a sustainable long-term sort of job. And if you have a sense that, you don't, that you're, the society you live in is not prioritizing working people's jobs, then it makes it less likely that somebody's going to want to go into a job that they think may not be secure long term, right? And I think there's a lot, as Jesse's saying, there's a huge disconnect between what's actually happening on the ground and what and 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 what people think. But I do think there is a legacy in Wisconsin, especially because of the manufacturing sector. And you know, we still have a lot of manufacturing jobs, but but because of what's happened to a lot of good manufacturing jobs, there still is a sense from a lot of people when they're thinking about what they're going to do for a living that you know. It, if, if they go into the trades, it's going to be something that may be less secure for them long term. They hear about factories closing. They hear, and I, I, know, I know that trades are not part of, you know, that most trades are not in factories, but it's harder for people to kind of delink those things, right? And so I think, um, you know, the way that we ensure that uh, people go into those jobs and the way that we make them a career is we have um, politicians prioritize the decisions that they're making around the decisions of working people first, giving them, making sure that their unions are strong, making sure that they have health care and all these other things. Um, and if we can do that, then um, that makes it more likely that people can go into whatever work it is that they find to be, you know, fulfilling and interesting and that pays them well. Okay, I have another question from the chat. Um, Given that project labor agreements and other tools are banned in Wisconsin, what tools are available to make sure green jobs are union and high quality? Do you have any thoughts on that, Jesse? Um, maybe add that to the barriers list from the first question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, with, with PLAs uh, and prevailing wage and things like that having been kind of stripped from Wisconsin, it definitely poses a challenge. Um, we need to rely on the ability to put massive amounts of people to work. Um, the non-union sectors, the non-union electricians, the non-union plumbers, um, typically those shops are, are, are small. Um, and when I say small, I mean 30 to 40 man shops. So 
take a just for an example, a non-union electrical shop. You know, they might have 20 employees, 30 employees. Uh, what's going on in Two Creeks right now? That's a 150 megawatt farm, uh, solar farm. Uh, we'll probably end up with 150 electricians at any one point in time, and that's just the electrical side of it. So unions, you know, have large numbers of membership, and the ability for the local union in Green Bay to draw on the Milwaukee local or the Madison local or locals from other states. Um, so it'd be nice to have project labor agreements where these developers are saying, all right, we'll, we'll sign a PLA and then we'll go union and then we'll use your union members. Um, but outside of that, you know, we have uh, an extra bargaining chip in the sense that we can say, yeah, you need this job done, you know, this 200,000 man hour job done in one year. We can do that for you. We have contractors, we have, you know, contractors who can basically ramp up and down as, as the workflow is needed. Um, you know, union contractor can easily go from 50, you know, electricians on the field to 100 electricians on the field in a matter of, you know, one or two weeks with, with zero onboarding. There's no training. There's no, you got to come in and, and we got to do some, um, some onboarding here. It, it's call the hall. I need 10 guys tomorrow. All right. 10 guys show up on the job site tomorrow. Hard hats on, ready to go. So we, we have that as a bargaining chip. Um, you know, these, these green jobs are not small in nature. Um, they're, again, very mechanically intensive, high number of, of labor hours. Um, so that, that's one of the, again, bargaining chips that, that I think the, the labor unions have in, in the numbers, the, the, the masses, the number of people to be able to put on those jobs without sacrificing a completion date or project overruns or duration overruns. Yeah, and, and, and I would just add, I mean, that, that's such a terrific question. I mean, you know, first of all, we got to change the law, okay? I mean, that's, we've, we've got to work toward that. But the other thing I would add is, is public pressure, right? So when it, when it comes time to, to, you know, to bid on contracts, this is where actually like the environmental movement can, can, can come into play, right? So like if, if there are sustainable jobs, you know, this, this is where we actually bridge that divide, the blue-green divide. You know, we, we've got to We've got to make sure that, you know, um, the environmental movement is pushing to make sure that that contract and they, you can put public pressure on these developers, right, to to sign a contract with a with a union outfit rather than going with non-union. And I think that's also the kind of thing that builds goodwill. So the next time um, that, you know, unions are, th are, are thinking about whether or not to support green policies, they know that they're going to have um, environmental activists helping them. So, you know, that, that's, that, that's, I think, a, a big opportunity to build solidarity. Um, so we're going to take one more question here. Um, and Megan, if you wouldn't mind maybe clarifying your earlier question a little bit, um, I'll read it really quick. And if she has anything else to add to it. Um, but her question is, so how do we change that story to get people into those jobs that we're talking about? And kind of how are we telling these stories now? So I was just asking, like, you were talking about coal miners and that dirty work. And how are we highlighting the stories of success stories? Um, and what are we doing as either an organization or a community to highlight those stories so that we can draw in more people into uh, the unions and the trades? that we normally wouldn't. I think it starts with the media. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff on the news, especially the last, you know, four or five weeks here, you know, nothing has revolved around anything positive in my opinion. Um, but it, when we do something good, let's, let's talk about it. And, and that falls, I think on us as, as unions, as labor unions, as contractors, as people who are in the construction industry, um, we need to have a louder voice. We need to really, promote ourselves and, and talk to our, our friends and family and, and the media and then the schools that we go into, we really need to, to, to fluff our feathers. I mean, we need to, we need to be proactive in promoting that what we do is, is good. Um, yes, there are days when you're, um, we put solar panels on roofs all year long. So there's days where it's 10 below zero and snowing and, and we're up there and it's not a fun day. Um, but there's days where we get to work on just, you know, the coolest projects in the world. Um, in my opinion, we, we get to do a lot of neat things and, and we really need to be promoting that. Um, and and, and I, I take onus on that. I, I think that does fall, um, a good portion of that falls on us as contractors, us as union members, us as um, labor unions to, to really promote what we do is good. Um, I think we do a little bit of it now. Um, you know, we also do a lot of community 
uh, heavily involved in the community. So our union is always working with the um, building the, the homes for heroes and, and working with Freedom House, um, donating time to Paul's Pantry and donating projects to Paul's Pantry. Um, those are really happy, you know, feel good stories, in my opinion, that, that we need to do a better job of, of pushing out there. And uh, we are electricians. Um, we're, we're, we're mechanically inclined. We're not Instagrammers. We're not influencers. So I know a lot of that can be done via social media. And, and sometimes it, we need to we need to rely on our younger generation electricians to to help us, you know, kind of bridge that gap of, of getting away from the, I'm, a, I'm just an old timey electrician to, hey, look what I did today. Um, there is a small challenge in some of that. Uh, some job sites are very private uh, and, and don't want, don't allow cameras on site, don't allow you to talk about what you're doing. Um, there's been, I think in Wisconsin, a few lawsuits from, from owners to general contractors for uh, posting videos of like a crane that fell over. Um, you know, there, there's, so it, there's gotta be a right way to do it. Um, you know, young electricians can't just run around, you know, the Procter and Gamble's of the world or the Georgia Pacific's or Kimberly Clark's taking photos of all the fancy paper making machines and say, Hey, look what I worked on today. Um, so we have to be a little smart about it as well, but I, um, I would take ownership on that. And I think that's a great question. And I, and I would just add quickly, I mean, you know, I think um, right now with the COVID-19 crisis and the work that we're seeing um, from, from people in a lot of, you know, uh, blue collar union jobs, there's a, there's a real opportunity to highlight that that's what's happening. I mean, a friend of mine, uh, my neighbor, you know, works at one of those paper mills and, you know, he's telling me about what his work schedule is like right now to make sure that people have the things that they need. Those are the kinds of things that we should be highlighting. He's a, he's a, you know, he's, he's a, he's a union worker. Um, uh, in, in Madison today, um, uh, my, uh, the vice president was there and I know that um, there were uh, union machinists who pointed out that they're saving people's lives by making respirators. So, I mean, these are, these are the kinds of things that we can be doing to showcase, you know, the kind of work that's being done and the, the really important work that's being done. It's, it's not just work to make a living. It's, it's uh, you know, work that um, is literally essential to our country. And if we think about, um, if we think about that in terms of, you know, the, 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 the whole sort of structure of American society, we can highlight a lot of this. And I think we should. Awesome. Okay. So I think we're going to wrap up with questions now. Um, but thank you, Jesse and John, for sharing all of your insights and opinions with us. And kind of circling back to Jesse, what you were saying about social media and how we frame things. Um, I just want to put in a quick plug for a couple of our other events going on during this Earth Week. Um, this whole week we have a, a media campaign called hashtag strike at home and we're asking all of you to make your own strike sign um, whether that be physically or virtually where you kind of show your solidarity for climate change action. Um, along with other strikers around the world. And then tomorrow we're running our hashtag I'm a conservation voter because campaign where you can post a video, a picture, a poem, anything that um, reminds you why you care about the environment and why you're a conservation voter too. So we ask if you want to participate in those, you can go to our website at Wisconsin, I mean conservationvoters.org slash events for more information. And yeah. yeah so, um and just really quick too, we are having um, a webinar on our latest clean energy toolkit. If you're interested in kind of getting where to jumpstart your community on clean energy resolutions and movements and things like that, where um, both Ellen, Ellen and I are from the Green Bay area, as Casey already mentioned, St. Norbert's passed a resolution for 100% renewable. Um, UWGB has as well, and then the city of Green Bay and the Green Bay Public Schools. Um, so that's just our local government, but that webinar is going to be happening this Thursday from 3 to 4.30. Um, we can put the Facebook link in the um, comments if we have, Casey, if you wouldn't mind doing that. <laughs> awesome. Um, it is, there is um, quite a few people signed up already. So if you do, are interested in doing that, I recommend signing up right away so you can get your spot. Um, so like thanks. Ellen said. Can I say thanks for everybody? Thanks oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> this was a fun conversation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you guys for coming again. Um, it was really great to kind of have that unique perspective on clean energy, things that we don't really hear a lot in the community. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. thank, 
Thanks, everybody. Uh, I do see uh, Lisa had a, just I want to answer this question real quick. Lisa had a question about uh, where to look to find uh, information on training in the trades and pay. Um, start with your local building trades. Um, just Google search, you know, building trades around whatever community you live in. Start there. They'll be able to direct you to the nearest apprenticeship program, depending on what trade you want. Um, that's a, probably the best place to start. Um, if anyone did have any follow up questions, we'll, I'll post my email in the comments. Um, you can just email them to me and I'll forward them on to the right people. Otherwise, we're just going to wrap it up here five minutes early. So, <laughs> thank everyone for coming. So, um, like I said, if you have any questions, just let me know. All right. All right. Jesse, keep in All touch. Right. Yeah.